classic go-to saying is if something's going up and no one really understands it's like there's more shorts than a Wham concert because everyone used to wear shorts to a Wham concert <laughs> while you're still in your teens dropping a quarter of a million quid in one day news used to come out at seven o'clock in the morning and we called him Minty because he used to turn up after eight <laughs> <laughs> you don't tell a lie twice and get away with it and this place the banker which was known as the bouncing banker then was the first place I actually had a drink in the city But any time I met Jimmy, we've always been about 10 pints in, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what most people would say. He's probably told me and I don't remember, but Jim. Hi. Uh, yep, me, I drew. Thank yep, you. Um, yeah, I started in the city in 1984. And this place, the banker, which was known as the bouncing banker then, <laughs> um, was the first place I actually had a drink in the city. And it, it was a company I joined called Charles T. Pulley, which later became Paul Gavette and ABN AMRO latterly after that. Um, in those days, yeah, it was our first night out. I was 16 years of age. And um, my nan at the time had a, had a, a flat that was in uh, was opposite Borough Market. And um, I had five or six pints, which was five or six pints more than I'd ever had in my life before. <laughs> Managed to make my way back uh, to Borough Market and... Uh, crashed out of my nan's uh, place and promptly wet the bed. So that, <laughs> that, was, my, that was my introduction to uh, drinking in the banker. And um, consequently after that, um, Did get after, a, a, after, a, <laughs> after a career at, uh, a short career at Charles Bully, where we, we were privileged to, um, to actually do the first um, IPO under Maggie Thatcher, which was British Telecom. Um, where I used to lay there on the floor sorting out Mrs. Megan's allotment letters of twos and three hundred shares to make that up into batches of fifty thousands and sixty thousands, and you used to have piles like that I of allotment a story letters. About that, Jimmy, when yeah, they had the, uh, when they yeah went literally up. laying on the floor, like right, we've got to make that batch a hundred thousand shares or two hundred thousand shares or whatever, and you used to have, right eight hundred, two hundred, blah blah blah. And you have to take that in a pile down to um, a place down by Ludgate Hill, uh, Barclays, and they had to put it all through the registrar and stuff like that. And uh, that was my introduction. So what like was that settlement back then? Week. Was that a week settlement, was it? Or? Uh, whenever they turned up, basically. Yeah. So uh, it, it was, it, in those days, you know, we, we all used to tea to settlement now, but in those days you could have uh, settlement as far out as T25. So you'd have 25 days where you, you know, you could say, I've bought the stock and pay for it 25, later. And, uh, 25 days later. And they were, the, they were the days that were really sort of like the Wild West in the stock market because, you know, people could yeah. buy stuff that they couldn't afford to pay for. So now we've got, obviously, the CFD market, which provides you know, leverage finance or whatever, or spread betting that provides leverage. But in those days, people just used to buy it on their word that they were going to pay for it. In, in those days, you, you literally, for, for the public offerings under, you know, under Thatcher, the government offerings, you applied as an individual. Yeah. You just applied. And then you'd get your allotment letter through the post. And then you had to find someone who you would sell it through, you know, like... Yeah, but how did I settle? Price. Did I settle? Did I just send a check with my allotment letter? Yes. Did that me settled up? Yeah, 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 yeah. You applied for your shares and you sent your check. Right. You had your shares. God, so, that is old story. Quite ridiculous. So, so basically, you know, if you bought 800 shares at 50p, it would be 400 quid. So you'd send a, you'd send a check in for 400 quid. Then they might scale you back on the allocation. Yeah. So you might only get 200 shares. So you get a check back for 200 quid. And your, I'm with and you. your 200 shares. So. I've still got clients that were dealing back in that day, and what a lot of them said, and you'd never be able to get away with this sort of thing now, but they would go through all their relatives and get them to subscribe and get allotment letters on their behalf as well, right? So there could be one guy theoretically putting in like 30 or 40 allotment letters. There. In those days, it was like if you was an employee, mm -hmm. you obviously got special allocation. It was going to be well oversubscribed. So if you knew someone, yeah. for instance, who worked at Welcome, for example, because there are a lot of these things. 
you, you would be guaranteed to get your allocation. So some people uh, would, some so people would. Some if you're, people, if so you're in the back office at Welcome and I'm your friend, I'll come and subscribe for you and I've got a decent chance of being filled. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I might be sitting in the back office at Welcome. I've only got 500 quid to my name. Yeah. You've got 25 grand, say. Yeah. And you go, well, I'll have 25 grand's worth. It's all right. And we'll, uh, we'll have a divvy up afterwards. So we're going to chat about the some other things in your career, but this whole trading on different settlement dates. So I said... You, you get in the leverage through the, the product straight away with the, the amount of lots you can take, etc. In, in the old days, when you're going to deal with people face to face or on the phone, it's quite important what that settlement date actually is. Yeah. So, like Jimmy said, if you're doing T25, you've got a month of free funding. You then want to be hearing and listening out for different settlements, don't you, when it's coming back? So, if someone's buying it for a month, they're expecting something to happen. Mm -hmm. Once you're in sort of 15 days in, you're expecting to see some T10 bargains that has left. Just what they don't want to do is actually have to put the money up. Yeah. They want to have sold before their money gets cashed properly. Yeah. And so what's an in and out. Right. So, then so that... you're buying T25 and selling yeah. T9. So when you got... just, just break that down and explain it. So if you're buying T25, I buy 10 grand worth of stock off Jimmy. Jimmy says, there you go, mate, you're served. Give me the cash in 25 days, right? But try and explain the T10 sale. What you mean by that is you're 15, I'm 15 days into that transaction. Uh, I can't sell the shares on a T1 settlement. That settlement has to match up to the settlement date that I've agreed with Jimmy, right? Yeah. So if I'm a seller, I'm a T10 seller, meaning whatever happens, Jimmy gets settled up, right? But when you're in when you're right. market making, so at the moment, the kids today, they're looking all on technicals. They don't know any of this, but they're, they're looking at it backwards facing, but they talk about their order blocks mm -hmm. and their gaps in the market and all this sort of stuff and where they expect the volume to be. Yeah. What I'm saying is, Going back in the day, you get used to dealing with people and you're hearing it and you see the, these bargains. Mm -hmm. That's where your order flow is. You know that 15 days in and there's suddenly people starting to T10, you know that the seller's coming. Yep. You know that they're cashing in. Something's, something's changed yep. and you need to... It's actually you know, easier to identify. As well, exactly. A lot easier to identify. So, so yeah, and, and, then, and then because the life floor gr was growing and growing and growing, this building that's above us now... <coughs> um, became the new life floor, uh, Dowgate Hill, uh, right above, which was a what, huge what, what was life? Floor. What did that stand for? Uh, London International mm. Financial Futures Exchange. Um, and the, the products were traded on there were gilts, short sterling, um, Euromarks, uh, FTSE 100, which was where I predominantly was, uh, Euro Swiss, uh, uh, Bobble, which was the Italian, um, uh, uh, no, Bobble was German yeah. two year. Um, BTP. Yeah, you had the uh, BTP, which was the Italian um, stuff. And also we had all the Eltom options, options come over there, which is yeah. London traded options market, which used to be on the old floor of the London Stock Exchange. Um, so they used to sit behind where the FTSE pit was. Mm. Um, and we also had the financial product options as well, which sat next to the sterling Must pits. have been quite an amazing time though, Jimmy, because all this is taking place in one room, so the atmosphere must have been electric at a place like Well, that. when you think you had 3,000 people, uh, I think the average age was something like 24, even, still even older than Chelsea's current squad. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was what, open outcry? So it was open outcry. So, for instance, I'll just give you a few, ha ha uh, few examples. You had to communicate verbally and by hand signals in the pit so if you if you were one bid for 10 lots because everything was measured in lots which had a financial value so one lot of buying the FTSE, FTSE um, future would be 10 pound a lot it was formerly 25 pound a lot but they changed it to 10 pound a lot to make it more Easy accessible for the basically mm -hmm. so you if you was buying your your hand would be pointing away from you, uh, sorry, towards you as such, and you'd say one for 10, one for 10, yeah? What's the one? And if you what's were selling, the, what's the, what's so one. one lot. So yeah. you'd, be, you'd be bidding, say, 31. So our, 31. our guys on this, in our system, it's all about how many lots you're buying, so yeah. this will make yeah. sense. So you're so. paying one for 10 lots, one bid for 10 lots. If you want to sell 10 lots, 10 at two. 10 at 2. And that's what you had to shout into the pit. Don't forget, I'm not the only person doing that. 
I'm surrounded yeah. by tiers of people. And are people shouting as well at the same time? Yeah, not, not everyone's just... shouting at the same time. And people are shouting, buy them, sell them, buy them, sell them, buy them, sell them. So if I'm selling 100, for instance, so I'm going 100 at one, because that's 100. So you, you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So <laughs> there it be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. All on your head, 60, 70, 80, 90. So if you're selling, let's say, 100 at one, someone will go buy 10, someone will go buy 20, buy 15, and, and you've got to add that up, to write that, that on the trading card, yeah, yeah. fill that in ticket, while everyone's screaming at you, did you get my two lot? Did you get my two lot? I buy two. And, you're, and you've, you're having to add that up, and then get that card back to your booth to get that inputted. Obviously, there was, there was video cameras up there. Well, and... this, is, this is what I was going to ask. I've got yeah. a couple of uncles that uh, were on life, and they tell me stories very similar to what you're, you're saying there. But something that amazes me is, at the end of the day, how there must have been so many bust-ups about trade errors that took place throughout the day, or were the cameras that accurate where there couldn't be a trade Did error? you have a pit manager as well? No, you, well, you, 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 had, you had pit managers, obviously, any discrepancies or errors, so you, like you say, oh, I've, I've oversold. So you, you turn around to your mates and go, you know, you're six, can I make five? And you're four, can I make three, etc." Yeah. Something like that. And you try and work it out yourself. But if there was something that was, you know, someone had bought 20 and you only put 10 to them and it was on the camera, you obviously had to fill it and you had a trading error. And there was video rooms that you used to go back. So were people you'd go in there this all day long? Manager, and sit, sit, stand there and watch that particular moment where you sold and he bought and who was right and who was wrong. And wasn't there a commit? Was it the blue button? Where yeah, you, you, had a, guys, you had a pit right? committee. Which, yeah, yeah another, com <laughs> another thing, never volunteer, that I volunteered to go on. Yeah. yeah, so you had to sit there and sort out any discrepancies that went to a higher level that you couldn't sort out in the video room. But was it, even though I bet it was quite lively, I bet you had some of the best times of your life there, Jimmy, was it, was it a bit more of a gentleman's market on that basis where you say if there was certain discrepancies that pulled up, you could generally sort it out amongst yourselves, even, even down a boozer probably from time to time, right? Yeah, yeah, very, very, very much so. You yeah. know, every, everyone knew what, what goes around and comes around. Yeah. And for instance, like the, the footsie pit, even now, we've all still got a chat going. Nice. And, the, and that disbanded in... 1999. Amazing. So yeah. we, we, we're all still, and we still have, you know, irregular sort of meetups. Nice. Some of us still get together out of work and everyone's doing different things. Yeah. So there's people on there who are now in Australia and doing stuff and this, that, and everything else. And people put something funny on there, or if we hear of, you know, bereavement amongst anybody, it all gets published on there and stuff. So, you know, there is still yeah. that, although we all, we all worked against each other to make money for it's still our own pretty purpose. much like a family isn't it? Yeah. without us all being there together we couldn't have you know you can't you can't job against an army of one can you no, so, so, I was, I was yeah. used to wonder if you fall out of someone and you, it's open out crying you've got to see you've got to actually see the signals and accept them could you like was it possible to ignore people did that trade have to take place not, not really you, you 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 didn't used to do that it, it just just the fact know, that you, I mean, there, there used to be a lot of ex expletives and a lot of shouting and heat at the moment stuff that went on. And then you'd be down here 10 minutes later drinking with that person yeah. or in Deacon's drinking with that person and having a game of pool. Yeah, it's the, One of the funny things they used to have in here, there was a, they used to have a, a ski machine downstairs. I don't know if you remember it. Where everyone yeah, used to jump slope. on that and like be doing that all lunchtime. <laughs> There's a figure out in a minute, you've got to get back. Hold on, I'm just doing a red run. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, oh, it was, it was yeah, some very, very high comedy times. And I do miss those days, but... Who did you actually work for? They were Jimmy? exhausting. Were you, were you a local there or did you work on behalf of a, a bank or... A uh, I worked, or worked for various uh, companies down there. I worked for... I did a bit of work as a local, then I, I worked for Cater Allen. What's a local? A local is someone who basically trades, they can be a broker or can trade proprietary or both, which was another thing that the stock exchange outlawed, which gave people, you know, opportunity that you could go down there, trade for your own account, as well as taking in brokerage commission. Thank you. 
Is it? Yep. Oh, it's not. Oh, is that you? <laughs> right, sorry. Can't be, can't be accused of nicking your yeah. beer. Oh, right, it. we're going to the video room now. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely it. That's what you call a definite trade-in error, and I think you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, where was I? Oh, I'm you explain, seeing explain what a local was on yeah, the so a local, a local would back, back themselves with their own money and, um, and trade. You know, they'd, they'd put up money with someone who would be be called a clearer. So you had someone, for instance, like GNI, uh, who would sit there behind your cash. So they would monitor your cash on a daily basis. So, you know, you might make a thousand pound as a, you know, trading proprietary for yourself. And you might make 500 pounds uh, broken, fill, filling what they used to call filling paper, which was someone giving you an order. So say Goldman's would turn around, their pit trader's not there. They'd turn around and say, yeah, can you sell 20 at five for me? So I'd just go, yeah, 20 at five, done. And then I'd write out, literally, I'd, I'd say, right, okay, I'm charging you one pound 50 per lot. Yeah. To trade that, so you just made 20 a, lots, so that's 30 you pounds. You could trade, trade your own account, but also make a bit of commission from those yeah. boys as well, right? And G&I would then send Goldman Sachs a bill for 30 quid. And, uh, you know, you'd get I paid hear, that um, and I, I, I've known and, and met a few of the guys, but I hear a few locals absolutely had it off there back in the day. They did. They were, you know... Like generational money. You know, I won't mention any names, but, you know, a, 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 a good old friend of mine you know, actually made... I know he made a million pounds in one day. Which was the day, yeah. What, in the footsie? The day when the... No, it wasn't the footsie bet. But the, 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 when the, the day interest rates went from... 8% to 9% to 10% to 15%. To 15%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there was so much confusion. Norman Lamont's yeah, question. Yeah. yeah, there was so much confusion that. And we're talking about a million quid here in the early to mid That's 90s. Early 90s isn't it? Yeah. yeah, mid early 90s, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd have to use your brain for this, but that's a lot <laughs> that's more than a, a million quid in today's money, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. 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 20 years at 3%. I was thinking to work that out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how much is that? That's probably one point four or so. At least. 1.4? Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Probably go 1.4. Not a bad day's work. No. No. So, so how, yeah. how did that all work then? Because now everybody, everyone we were talking about earlier, you've got your charting machines and it's all done for you. Mm. How do you work out where the market's going in an open outcry? Where do you see the prices? The thing is, is what, what, you, what you'd have something like that, yeah. But when you've got interest rate decisions happening, because obviously we didn't have the power of media in those days. So yeah. anything, you just get flash across... Inflation tapes. board, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, you, 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 you'd see that figure, of blah, 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 blah. There were screens around, but it was about who, who reacted first. And obviously, if you're in the pit, your advantage is you can see what's coming in. Yeah. All right? And, and the people who are going to be reactive, don't forget, if you're working at a desk at Goldman's or, or at Morgan Stanley or something like that, you, you, you've, got to, chain be, you've got to be react you. You're reacting quicker than the people in the... Uh, slower than the people in the pit. Yeah. A hell of a lot slower. Yeah. Because you've got to see that information, then decide what to do, and then you've got to get that send the order info down. into the pit. Yeah. Mm. So the guy... So... Um, so the guy who's seen it on the screen in the pit has already hit the bids. Yeah. And he's hit the bids, and they're trading down 20... Before the It used to be called 20, 20 ticks. So 20 points. So... Yeah. Say they were trading at 20, they're now trading at the figure. He sold his, his lots out at 20, and by the time the Goldman's, et cetera, guy's seen it, they're now trading at figure double O. So yeah. he's the buyer now. Yeah. Yeah? So he's taken that advantage because, you know, we're, we're buying now... The, te the, the, the advantage is in the technology. Yeah, so this is so, when... when um, so where we see now we've got high-frequency traders who are, who are that, you know, momentary sens sensitive. I mean, we're talking about milli, milli, milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And they actually get their offices as close to the exchange as they can. Because even with the power of the, 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 the big multi-fiber pipes, they still get that information that fraction, fraction, fraction of a second quicker yeah. than the people who are even a mile down the road. Or so that's always been like three the case. Miles down so, the road. so in, in this world now, and all the your kids on uh, our chat stuff, they talk about liquidity sweeps. That's an example in real time, in real life, how that would happen. That, but what that, Jimmy's saying now, I'd imagine now would be hooked up to some form of algo, right? Yeah, is, exactly, uh, in the real world. 
Do you do much uh, trading yourself now, Jimmy, on your own book, or...? Uh, I don't anymore. And I, and I tell you for why, Drew, I find that being a broker, I don't think in a professional capacity that you can punt and broke properly at the same time. I agree. Because yeah. you've, got you've, got one, conflict. you've got one eye on what you're doing and predominantly if you get news out in that stock that you're yeah. trading for yourself, yeah. you, 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 you forget your clients yeah. and, and you know there might be something going on in what they what they're looking they at. They need your attention. They're, they're paying your you know they're paying your bread and butter. Yeah. You should be looking at what they're doing yeah. rather than absolutely oh, agree right. So, I, so when you, you say you're, you're a broker that means you're getting paid commissions for executing trades for them or yeah, yeah, pretty much. or whatever. The, the way my model works is I'm on what is known as a an IDB which stands for an interdealer broker. Um, so I trade I don't trade for any private individuals at all. I don't I don't do that at all. Every, everyone I trade for is is either a bank or a broking house or you know security license, and and a lot of my stuff I put trades together between two counterparties. Uh, I find a buyer or a seller, uh, normally of stock that is generally liquid, i.e., there isn't the the amount of shares published either side of the bid to offer spread that they could take to f fill their order, fill their client at that particular price. So for instance, if a bid and offer spread is say 48 to 52, I might get a client who says, well, I can't, I can't pay 52, but I can pay 50. So I've got to then go out and try and find someone who could sell 49 to give me that penny that penny turn yeah. so i've got to do that and then i might get someone who come back and say well i can't sell at 49 but i can sell at 50 if you can get your guy to pay a little bit more so what then i would enter in negotiation for instance and say well if you can pay 50 and a half i reckon i can get him to sell at 49 and a half and then you you know you work your magic, <laughs> and um, and hopefully the bow breaks and the baby but that's, falls. That's the true definition of a broker. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. So for, so for that, so if you want to see a microcosm of that in our system, we're dealing in majors and you know major forex and indices and stuff like that. But you can drop into details and look at the depth of the market, and that's what Jimmy's talking about. It's how both the bid and offer side have got volume attached to them. And there are people that will only trade with people they know and trust within that in the real world. So you can either put a limit in and hope that someone either takes it or hits it. But often, and the more, more esoteric a market you get into, if it's equities like we've all been involved in, etc., you need people you can trust. And that's why you go to a broker like Jimmy, someone that can go and speak to the other side who normally would be scared stiff of opening their order to someone. But, but if you can have someone that you trust, it <coughs> opens it all up, doesn't it? But, I still think know. the share market there's still a lot of good relationships across town. And it's good that, grounding, that isn't it? Because it shows you, shows you good behaviours and know why you have relationships between people and absolutely. why that counts. Yeah, yeah there's still a, still a large element of Dixon, me and Pacton, which is the old stock exchange um, motto, meaning my word is my bond, and everything stems down from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you don't, you, you don't tell a lie twice and get away with it. Absolutely. You ruin your own, ruin your own uh, market, don't you, as they say. Yeah. Right, hit some balls, Jim. Let's see what you got. So that's all, that's, I find it interesting, Jim, because um, if you were doing PA trades or if you, you get to work, you don't just put people together, do you? You sometimes work orders for people. Yes, as well, yes. Uh, a client might say to me, you know, um, thanks, you know, because obviously part of my, a lot of the job as well is, is sourcing information for people. Yeah. Uh, because now you have MIFI 2, etc., a lot of research is non publishable and you can't send it out, you can't forward it on, but you can relay the upgrade, so like or, an intermediary, upgrade or downgrade of, and if you find a small summary of it somewhere, you can, you can pass on that information. You have to be very careful, obviously, about what you do and what you say and 
and how you go about it. But within the, you know, within the guidelines and, uh, you know, statutory guidelines, you know, you can dig down and, and find out things or you might find a press article that would be published in a German paper or a, a Dutch paper or something like that or something in the Dutch media that suggests that a company, say, for instance, Unilever is doing something that will relate to the share price move because a lot of people see things move and don't know the reasons why. And they they get asked by their underlying client, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And if you come up with the answers and you get the information from people, they'll turn around and say, there's an well, that's, that's great. There's a, there's a ticket for you. Go and buy me 25,000 buns or something. And give so you this is what I said to people at the back, going, you know, what's moving a share price? And I said, well, when people definitely know, don't know what's going on, they'll say there's more buyers and sellers or something as trite as that. And it really... You need people like Jimmy Beaven around. There's hundreds of people like him finding out from everyone what it is. And that's, it's not just what they call the rumour mill. It's actually the fact finding, isn't it? And you get out or there. The, and... the, or the classic go-to saying is uh, if something's going up and no one really understands, so there's more shorts than a Wham concert because everyone used to wear shorts to Wham concerts in the 80s. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That you're you're going to have to get on Google for that one. That was always a, always a classic. How did you get into trading and how did you learn all the jargon and... What, what do you use today to, to look at prices? So I got into trading because um, my dad was a stockbroker. Right. And uh, I'm still going, by You're the still way. going, aren't you? Uh, so, and in the mid-80s, it was when the stock exchange was very much starting to expand and um, it was the precursor of what was called Big Bang, where the... American banks and the global banks started looking at the, the stock market opening up, going more desk-based, the floor finishing, yeah. and buying into the old jobbing firms and the old broking firms. Because what was the criticism of the old ways? Was it just that it was a little bit jobs for the boys and you couldn't get involved in the good trades and all that sort of stuff? I think it was more globalisation. Right. You know, Americans wanted, yeah. a, wanted a piece of Europe and... Europe wanted a piece of America and Japan wanted a piece. And, yeah. you know, so it was globalization. If you were a big bank, you know, if you were a Mitsubishi or you were a Yomichi or a Nomura or you were a Morgan Stanley or whatever, you had to have a global presence in these securities because your clients this wanted what, to um, trade globally. I found it they don't funny. want to just, all oh, right, okay, we're Morgan Stanley, we only trade US securities. They want to go, right, okay, I want to buy, be able to buy some of these British telecom. I want to buy some of these British gas. You know, they, they wanted to get involved. So that, that, was, that was why it really happened. Um, and obviously the stock exchange, which was members only. So my dad was uh, yeah, an original I mean. member so, and had, had his share in the London stock market. That all had to get bought out. And then the London stock exchange became a public company. You are on reds, aren't you? You're just using that for yeah. placement. Proper, proper player. I might have lost it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you ain't far away from a seven ball at the moment. I know, well, uh, I've just got a pot of it. It's six balls. Plenty of time. Back in the day, that's a KFC bucket that you have to get. If, you, if you've got six balls in my boozer, you've got to go get a KFC bucket for everyone. He's Ooh. nearly fluted that and all, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, so that was, a, that was a, quite a nice introduction. While well, you're still in your teens, dropping a quarter of a million quid in one day. Mm. Yeah, but you know, One of those. involved from there, and after 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 Fleming's, I then went to I went to Credit Lyonnais, right? Which uh, which Fleming's was the old one. Lang and Crookshank, and uh, and from there I went to Strauss Turnbull, which became Society General, and then I decided to take my uh, take my chances on the uh, on the life floor. And then when life finished up, by hook or by crook, I ended up back in the stock market. I don't know if you've covered this, but now. where within that journey did you guys meet? Okay. I mean, I've asked that. How long have you guys known each other for? Well, since late 90s, basically. Yeah, since I, I, came, I, off, uh, I, I came up from the life. I sort of knew Planty more. I knew other people at UBS more than Planty because my dad was very good mates with... Johnny Foster. Yeah. And, um, so you were just cleaning the cars, so. That's right. <laughs> no, no, but, but 
within like the ID, yeah. IDB world or, or whatever, you get certain clients to cover and uh, Planty was covered by somebody else, really. So it was only through sort of... Like association, when it Association and going out and, out and you know, gatherings and trips away that we sort of got to know each other, oh, really. Okay. And, and late and nights. And then, and then late, late, late later on... As you know, as I moved away from that firm or whatever, I was able to talk to Planty directly, more freely, yeah. directly. So yeah, so then we became a lot sort of closer, really. But it's interesting. You, you both brought it up in in a way about when you first start in the city and oh, gets ignored now. But you do literally start off right at the bottom rung, and you it's, you'd at best describe it as character building now. But you had to well, that, that's... you had to show the respect and learn your. But Your stripes, didn't it's, you? it's where you survive or not. I would say that of the 20 people who start with me, I'd be amazed if, including myself, <coughs> two, two of those guys are still knocking about and yeah. working in town. That, that was, that they were the averages. I mean, I find it, I find it amazing. Survival, yeah. isn't it? That's it. But you get, you know, you, you get kids now, they're at university, they think they own the world, they think they're owed something. I think, I you... think at this stage you shake my hand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get remember the Australians you see when they get out for a duck and they'd have this duck with a tear coming I think there's uh, still quite a lot of your oh, stuff left. I don't know what you're talking about. That's in fact victory. Well played, sir. But what I'm saying is when you had to make your way and you knew that the, you, it's a fantastic industry to be in, you you listen to your, your elders and respect them. You did what they asked you to do and some of these things could be so menial and you get kids now going to HR and refuse, I'm not going and fetching sandwiches and it's all about being part of a team, isn't it? I mean, I can, yeah. I can actually remember some of the things I've been at, to do. Being at Fleming's and them saying, um, "Oh, well, well, we need to get a compliance officer." Do you, do you fancy being a compliance officer, Jimmy? And I was like, "I'm a young trader. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we need to get one. Do you want to do it?" And I'm like, "No, not really." Yeah. Wish I had now. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the only growth that's industry. That's a game to be in, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's the yeah. only growth industry. But. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it used to be yeah, an HR. See a poor dentist. Remember that saying? You see a poor I hope dentist. not, because that's what my daughter's and doing. And now you'll never see a poor compliance officer. No. Right? Oh. I mean, that industry's an HR. I mean, you know, we we told HR what to do in those days and whatever, but oh, not anymore. And very, very different. I remember, you know, it's like, Plenty, do you want to go to uh, Islington from from you know Broadgate get fish and chips in for a team? The team's like, you know, half a dozen. I'm in. Yeah, not a problem. And by the time I went, it was like the old. Comedy classic in it where you look at the list and then you drop it and it hits the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had but you did it. I don't know, I had 32 to go. I was a taxi up there, taxi back, three boxes, yeah. having to ferry back, get, get, the, get the lift, well, hold, hold that lift while I go back to the cab and get that, that was part and parcel. That was part and parcel of all character right? building, yeah, yeah, you don't know yeah. that. I, 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 I was commenting to someone the other day about how, like, these days, a lot of stuff is run now over, whereas everyone used to phone each other up or you know, call each other or and, 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 and do it that way. Everything's so much more done on on chat, on Bloomberg chat and this, that and everything yeah. else. And when we started, there was a, an internal phone line in the stock exchange called the STX system, which was the stock exchange, telephone exchange. And I can remember when I was a junior, if the STX rang more than twice, you used to get a most almighty rollicking off your well, We used to have both of you doing the mercury asset management, black rock as it is now, and it literally was that. If it, if it rang more than twice, whoever's line it was, there'd be something thrown, there'd be a phone yeah. coming out. you get something thrown yeah. at you. Yeah, or absolutely you get a, ridiculous. And you'd, you'd be get, hauled yeah. in front of everybody. There wasn't, there, was, there wasn't any mental health situation there. You, if you don't <laughs> pick that phone up, you're getting a dead arm. Yeah. That, was, that was literally it. It really was. But, you know, that's because the client was first. And if that, if that client happens to ring someone else, that might be the biggest trade he wants to do that week, but not, it's not just that. They'll cut you off and go, they obviously don't want our business. We'll take it to a different broker. Barclays will get it or something. Yeah. So it was literally... And you, you find this, when you've worked in a city and you try and get a job done in the real world and people can't be asked to ring you up when they're not coming, you, you're like furious, aren't you? Because the client wants everything. You literally, in the city, you know that that's, that's the bread and butter. You, but, you but put them every, first or you don't get a repeat business. But I also think that... the that then it was so much better because you were really incentivized to do stuff right. Yeah. You was incentivized to do it correctly. Whereas, you know, since the since two thousand and eight and the aftermath of that, 
and when they capped all the bankers' bonuses and whatever, you've got to remember, you know, people always glorify all oh, the city boys, the city boys, the city boys. People in this industry are used to getting up at five in the morning, even if they've got in at four in the morning, yeah. and doing another 11, 12 hour day. Or sleeping below the desk, yeah. <laughs> with, no, with, no, with no, you know, no rest, you've got to go in and you've got to do that and you've got to be expected to perform. You turn up late, you're buying the desk breakfast, so not only has it cost you 200 quid, et cetera, in somewhere you shouldn't have been, you've then got to pay a toll on top of that as well by getting everyone, by getting in everyone fact, breakfast. Fact, as you're alluding to, the bloke who used to cover me at UBS became known as Minty, didn't he? What yeah. was that? Yeah, he used to be called Minty because uh, uh, all the uh, news used to come out at seven o'clock in the morning and we called him Minty because he used to turn up after eight. <laughs> <laughs> I love it but this is true and there's a, there's a good point to come from that because as you've noticed from some of the videos we've put out already with the successful traders one thing that really comes out of that is not only is it a long journey of becoming profitable but they find a way to do it and it, as they say I, couldn't, I didn't realise it at first but it's boring it's doing the repeat stuff the same stuff every day and that's what the professionals do they, come, they wake up half five six o'clock get into the city for seven and they're plodding through the news flow hoping that you find the, the big the yes. big trades isn't it consistent consistency. consistency yeah the old saying in life you, you can't win a raffle if you don't buy a ticket yeah if you're not there they'll go elsewhere <laughs> i'm a poet and i didn't know it <laughs> quality yeah. but yes yeah, it's, it's just about trying to maintain you, you know, sometimes you can't do it all the time. But <laughs> and are you, you a technical and, trader at all? Do you know, I be as professional as possible. Um, I, I can look at technicals. I, I do understand you don't want to run out of candlesticks, especially in the winter. <laughs> 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 but yeah, yeah, I, I used to do pie charts, but I end up eating them. <laughs> 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 and you, know, you say he's here all week it's only Tuesday you're in trouble <laughs> and I tried to do some parabolic stuff but the shoot wouldn't open <laughs> yeah so no I, 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 I can look at technicals and you know you look at sort of head and shoulders and check your collars afterwards <laughs> uh, yeah various bits I've, I've worked with um I've done a couple of courses uh, on Bloomberg. There's uh, an old guy who's a very famous technical analyst, this guy called Trevor Neal, who's very good. Right. Um, but that's not really my thing. My, my, my thing is, right, these are 48.52. There's 4p there. Where can I extract a penny yep. or a tuppence out? Yeah, right, yeah, I was explaining yeah. this though, the other day to someone, and this will be particularly pertinent for you, that when you're struggling and you're in the system and it's going wrong, you need to have a break, sometimes it's worth just watching the, the actual movement of the, the price ticking. You don't need to have a, a position on. You don't need to have your, you know, your charts going out there. You actually watch. You can see where the support and resistance is, can't you? You get a, you get a feel for what, where, what, what which particular people come back. And the, the, the kind of people I'm trading for, it's about this is where it's client differentiation. If Someone like you, if you're making recommendations, they're following you. Someone like me who I'm basically speaking to predominantly market makers or whatever. A lot of time when you're market making, as you know, your positions are made for you, which i.e. Your, your, your book re, is the opposite of sometimes a lot of where you want to be. When, you stop, when you're full of the, stock, it's you, not going the, up. The, 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 the client has taken, your, has taken your stock from you that you wanted yourself. So you have to facilitate... So it's pointless, for instance, saying to, saying to someone, okay, I think Bellway, for instance, if we're talking about building stocks, I think Bellway are oversold and I think Persimmon are overbought, uh, looking at my chart. And the guy turns around to me and goes, oh, that, that's great. I've just been taken out by BlackRock of 50,000 Bellway. So... Yeah, that's, rather a lot than of, that's, a lot good, that's a lot of good to me. And you end up rubbing the guy up the wrong yeah. way. So you, what you're trying to say, in essence, like it's completely different things what you guys do. You don't want to take a view, do you? You're not looking to take if, a view. If, 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 if you're I, looking if, to match a, a large if I, if, if, and seller. Yeah, if I, if, I, if I take a view, 
the best thing I can get is someone go, oh, well done. Yeah. The worst thing I can do is... Really piss people off. Yeah, you've, you've just cost me yeah. 25 grand. And there. it's not worth the well done, is it, if you do no, get it because, right? because, yeah. you know, if I say to someone, oh, well, he's Bellway look oversold, and he goes, all oh, right, okay, I'll buy 25, and then... He's offside. They, they come out of a profit warning, or the CEO resigns, <laughs> yeah. which is, you know... Ultra vires, is that what they call it, <laughs> yeah. John, in your, uh, in, your, in your native Latin? But you're a couple uh, of them away yeah. from not getting a phone call, weren't you? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so what, what, is, what is the point? What is the point, yeah. Yeah, in, 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 in dangling your goula, ghoulies in the custard yeah. for, for the sake of a well done. Mm -hmm. Because that, 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 that bit of information that I could tell my people that would spend me maybe 25 minutes looking at an, uh, a, an, an intraday or a, or a spread chart looking at um, that going that way and that going that way and that going that way, etc. And where they, you know, like BP Shell, where they gap out and stuff like that. Yeah, I can, I can do all that, but it's not. It's not what really, your punters it's want. It's not then. really what my punters want. Yeah, of course. No. But like the other way around of that is I'm trying to explain to people where the fundamentals come in and how that combines. Oh, for really. you it's mega important. Yeah, yeah. For you it's mega so, important. So, but what yeah. I'm trying to now get across to people is they you can do your chart all day long and you can just see where the previous levels of order blocks have been and why that might be. It. But there's no reason in the world why that they're gonna, that volume's going to be there if the fundamentals have changed. Mm -hmm. Because we're dealing with the people, as you were saying earlier, Goldman's, they've, they've seen the data, they're having their meeting, they're going to be the biggest buyer or seller. Which way are they going to jump on that data will determine whether that is a resistance and support level, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. you know, and it's getting that across people. Oh, no, it's, got to, it's got to definitely bounce off that because of it was there before and it's, it's worked four times in a row. Yeah, but if the fundamentals have changed, that's got to count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, 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 if ever getting people arguing it's got to be fundamentals, it's got to be technicals, it's, it's how they marry up in real life, isn't it? Yeah. And it depends who your, who your punters are within that. And also the fact that, you know, I'm covering everything from micro caps to... To full foot season. To, to biggest Pan European Europe. companies yeah. or anyway, anything in between. So I could be trading in, you know, Louis Vuitton or I could be trading in Judges, Sci Judges Scientific or something, which have got... A, a, a next to nothing market cap against something that's a multi-billion pound company. Mm -hmm. So anyone who says to me, you know, what's your view on this? How am I going to know? I'm just here. Yeah, yeah. They're, at, they're apples and oranges to me. If yeah, I yeah, can't yeah. sell the apples, I'll sell the oranges. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But that, that, that is interesting because I've been trying to explain how there are 20 plus different players in the market, all with all in at the same time with a different view and a different motivation. Yeah. I say a lot of people do literally trade it I mean, like Peel Hunt's small cap arena is based on alphabetical letters. Whereas if you go higher up the market cap, it's down to sectors, you know. Mm. And it, it really doesn't matter. You said it could be apples and pears. You either trade the price or you trade the fundamentals. And yeah. sometimes it's a mixture. It's yeah. And that, that is one of the, 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 the joys is the diversification of the different ways you can trade. Absolutely. You can, you can both be right and you can both be wrong. Mm -hmm. That's right. I could I could sell you stock I could sell you stock at five, they go up to ten, you take your profit at ten, and then an hour later they can be trading twenty lower. And you, zero, you stayed, and you zero, stayed short because I've stayed short. Mm -hmm. So Jimmy, that was a wonderful introduction for everyone from someone who's been there, seen it, done it from all forms of markets. Thanks so much for your time today. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Cheers, Jimmy. boys. Thanks for coming Thank on, you. Mate. Really appreciate it. Looking Thank forward you. to part two. We've been getting the right juicy bits. <laughs> <laughs>